Welcome to an evening with James Boyle as he examines the events leading up to the war with the Lower Rogue Native Americans on this, the 162nd anniversary of the burning of Gold Beach. Brought to you by Curry Public Library in association with Curry County Voices and the Gold Beach Rotary Foundation. A graduate of the University of Oregon and an organizer for the South Coast Writers Conference, James Boyle is Gold Beach's own author of at least seven works. On today's broadcast, author James Boyle provides an educational and historic view based on his new nonfiction work, Nothing But a Blaze, which includes an overview of the governmental and quasi-governmental policies in effect during the years shortly before Oregon's admission as a state. This broadcast was recorded live from the Curry Public Library, Harold Hogg Library Learning Center, on Friday, February 22, 2019, between 5.30 and 7 o'clock p.m. This program contains material that is representative of the views and attitudes of the time during which these events occurred. Please view these elements in their historical context. And now, our feature presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Hey, thank you all for being here on a Friday night. This is a, an awesome crowd to come support a local author. We're so glad to see you all. Um, my name is Rebecca. I schedule programs here at the library. have a pretty great job. Um, and we have some of those future programs in the back. Uh, I have some, I'll put some more out, some March program schedules and flyers with some of the upcoming programs that we're doing. So, so please check those out. And if you ever have an idea for a program you want to do, please let me know because this is your library and we want to incorporate those ideas. Um, this evening, um, I am just going to keep this short and sweet, and we're going to uh, introduce uh, Jim Boyle, who's going to talk about um, the Rogue Indian Wars and, and one of his newest books. So please welcome Jim. Thank you, welcome. I thought a dancing new. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm overwhelmed by the interest in this. Uh, I started writing this book because I moved here when I was 16 with my family, and there is nothing about the Indian War on the coast of Oregon. There are stuff in other books, like Requiem for People, which is the standard for the Rogue Wars, but it's like one chapter in the book, so it doesn't go into what caused the war, what, what led to it. And so I decided to do some research on my own and wrote, and it's a real short book because it's a real short book. <laughs> okay, so on this day, 163 years ago, February 22nd, 1856, Indian agent, sub-agent for the Port Orford District of the Oregon Territory, Benjamin Wright, stopped on his way up the Rogue River at the camp of the Gold Beach Guards. Company K, the Second Oregon Mounted Volunteers. He had dinner with them. Then he and the commander of the volunteers walked a short way distance downstream to a cabin where they would spend the night. Sometime during the night, they were awakened by someone pounding on the door. When he opened the door, he was dragged out and attacked with knives and hatchets. Captain Poland went to help him. He also was overwhelmed. That is how the war started. But the war is not the beginning of the conflict. The war is the end of the conflict. So we're going to look at some of the things that led up to it. In the 10 years before the war here, the United States had gone through its greatest territorial expansion since the purchase of the Louisiana Territory. 1845, the United States annexed Texas, which didn't make Mexico happy because they thought it was still a rebellious province. And the Oregon country was claimed by both the United States and by Great Britain and Canada, and it included all of 
We were just probably up to the border, Alaska. There was a group of people who really wanted us to have the whole Oregon Territory, all the way up to the border of Alaska. They had a, a line called 45, 5440 of a fight. But the government, in their wisdom, knew they were going to have a war with Mexico and didn't want to fight both Mexico and Britain at the same time. So in May of 1946, we declared war on Mexico. In June of 1946, we signed a treaty. Oh, that went fast. We <laughs> treated with Great Britain establishing the Oregon country, the Oregon Territory. In 1848, Oregon became an official territory with the United States. In 1850, California became a state. In 1853, Washington Territory split off in the Oregon Territory. Now, now what was driving this huge territorial expansion is, remember this from your grade school? Manifest Destiny. <laughs> And Manifest Destiny is, was a term coined by John O'Brien, John O'Sullivan, editor of the New York Morning News, who, it is the right of our Manifest Destiny to overspread and possess the whole of the continent, which Providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federated self-government entrusted to us. And so it's, you can see a lot of the themes here. Uh, liberty pulling a telegraph wire, going out west. The trains, the covered wagons, the farmers, the gold miners, and ahead of them are the Indians and the wild animals. It's all about pushing civilization west, civilizing the frontier. The issue with Manifest Destiny, not everybody in the United States believed it, but everybody who settled the west did. And the problem is, if it's your destiny to occupy some country, it justifies anything you do to get it. It's like God's chosen people. Oh, we can kill everybody because God wants us to. And the Oregon country set up a system where you, you could get plots of land. It was later became the donation land claim act. But Oregon, if you got there, a single white man could get 320 acres. A white family, a white married couple, could get 640 acres. All they had to do was occupy the land, till it for four years, and it was theirs. And so this was a, you know, a good deal for people back east who didn't have any land. But this had didn't happen in the rural country because there is no farmland. <laughs> yeah, there is no arable land. Yeah, there's a little bit here, there's a little bit up the river, a little bit, but not enough to draw settlers in, but they weren't. At this time, the U.S. was still an agrarian society. Everybody wanted to farm. That's how you made your living. And our area, as those who live here know, it's really hard to get here. <laughs> yeah, you know, at this time there were no roads, there were no trails. Um, the mountains were almost impassable. If you're coming from the south, you ended up on the beach most of the time. Um, from, from the north. The only way to bring supplies in was by ship. But all the rivers on the south coast, Pistol River, the Rogue River, Chetco, have a tendency to form bars at the mouth of the river. So at low tide, or in the summertime when the river levels are low, you run a real good risk of drowning your ship on the bar. And so it was tricky at best. The thing that changed that for the Rogue River area was the discovery of gold. So in 1853, someone discovered that the black sand around the mouth of the Rogue and along the beaches contained gold dust. And suddenly, everyone was interested in this. Now, Captain William Tishner, this is an older, older photograph at the time this all took place. In 1851, he was 40. And he brought a group of settlers and landed them at the site of Port Orford now. Of course, the Katoma peoples living there to defense of that and attack them and drove them up in Battle Rock. But the half dozen or so, dozen or so white men had a cannon and they wiped out, just blew a hole through the Indians' attack. And that night they escaped from the cover of darkness, made their way north to the Yamakoa River 
and white civilization there. Not to be, uh, you know, not to be discouraged or anything. Kishner came back in August with a bigger party, several dozen people, and they didn't face any resistance, probably because the Kutomas lost most of their men in Alaska, so there was nobody to fight anymore. Now, the factor X in this conflict is uncomfortable, but it's racism. This is 1856, four years before the Civil War. The biggest issue in the United States was slavery. But even many of the people, including Abraham Lincoln, who were opposed to slavery did not think blacks were equal to whites. And it's almost, looking back on it, we were very judgmental, but this was not a new, that's just the way everything was back then. And here you can see, 1856 was about the start of bloody Kansas, which if you don't remember that, was a mini, uh, mini civil war in the state of Kansas. And even in Oregon, the Oregon Constitution of 1849 says that only white men and the sons of white men can vote. You know, women weren't allowed to vote, and any person of color was not allowed to vote. Um, in the, the later Constitution, they banned slavery and banned indentured servitude, but made it in the Constitution that no free Negro or mulatto not residing in the state at the adoption of this Constitution shall come to reside or be within the state or hold any real estate or make any contracts or may, may obtain any suit. So basically, yeah, there's no slavery but no blacks in here. And what I found really interesting about that is they never even mentioned the Indians. The only mention of the Indians was the Constitution says Congress reserves the right to declare war except against the Indians and communities can declare war against the Indians. So this is, a, this is from California, but it's a picture of the miners running us loose. Okay, there's always two sides to conflict. These are the major villages of the Tututni that will fit on my slide. The Tututni was not really a tribe, but it was a collection or loose confederation of individual villages who all shared a similar language, similar religion, similar culture. And just for ease of use, everyone started calling them Tututni, which is just the name of one of the villages. And so I will call them Tututni just because it's easier to trying to figure out what your village was involved. And they were foragers. They lived on the, off the land. They harvested salmon in the salmon runs. They ate urine elk from the hills, gathered acorns, gathered camas bulbs, gathered berries in time, lived in dugout plank houses, split from cedar logs. And similar to the long houses, of the northwest coast, instead, but instead of being like a clan, it was each house was one family. And generally speaking, the woman and her children slept in the house, all the men slept in like a sweat lodge. So all the men were separate from the women, most of them. But what I found most interesting is something that Germans called Bergeld. It's a system of blood money. And because the problem with the foraging economy is if you go to war and you lose a couple of men killed and a couple more wounded, they can't get food for you. And so a loss in the war immediately hurts you economically. They didn't have a separate warrior class. So they developed a system of fines for various offenses, everything from theft to murder. Um, a young man from my village goes to the fishing hole of the next village and gets caught. They come to me, the chief, and say, we found this young man from your village on our territory, so I pay the fine. Or he pays the fine, if he can't pay it, the chief pays it, and then he owes it to the chief. And he becomes basically an indentured servant until that fine is paid off. And it's very complex, but it did a very good job of keeping a conflict from turning into a war because nobody could afford a war. And so you, the German, Germans had the same thing, they called it Weirgill, I don't know what the, in the Tzutni called it. This is Gale Parish. 
He was, as you can see, Indian sub-agent for the Port Orford District until 54. He, was, he came to Oregon as a Methodist missionary. And he co-founded the Columbia University, I believe. He was on the road to Regions. But in 54, he was tasked by the Superintendent of Indian Affairs for Oregon Territory with doing a survey of the Indians of the Southwest Coast. And this is a map that's based on his report of what the territories of the various villages were. And this is from Port Orford, basically down to Virginia really down here. And you can see each, and they, Tatutni didn't do property like we do, but they were very protective of their territory. You had to have permission to harvest in their territory. So you can see that on the Rogue River, the Yashutes were, they had two villages right on the mouth of the river. Farther up, the Tatutni, the Makanantun, and the Shasta Costa up at the mouth of the Illinois River. The Quachis were at the mouth of Beaver uh, Creek. Chetlesson towns were at the mouth of Pistol River. And Cousinans were at the mouth of Muscle Creek, just south of that mountain, and then by the north. What I found most interesting is he did a, a census of the Indians. Now, I don't know what his methodology was, did he go in and physically count them, or did he have them report to him? And it, we, there's no saying what it is, but I thought it was really interesting. Because this goes from basically Bandon down to the Chetco and up to the Illinois River, and there's a total of 1,300 Indians, which is not very many, even for such a large expense. Most of the villages are about 100, 120, up to 150 people, but the other thing I found really interesting and puzzled me is there aren't very many children. You know, you got 20 women, 21 children. You got nine women, nine children. 45 women, 36 children. And my instinct, my intuition said there should be more children than that. And the reason, I don't know, this is just my supposition, was disease. <laughs> According to the People Are Dancing Again, which is the official history of the Confederate tribes of the Silets, the peoples of the Southwest Coast lost 67% of their population to disease. Which is really good because the Kalapuya lost 97%. The uh, Chinook at the mouth of the Columbia lost 99%. There was a, I believe it was a Tillamook band that was supposed to come talk to the U.S. Army, the whole band showed up as 14 people. That was all that was left. And the smallpox and measles, it's called virgin territory epidemic. What they will do is they'll go to a, uh, a group of people like Indians with no, no way, no defense against it, and it will kill a percent, like 30%. The ones that didn't kill will have immunity from smallpox again, but their children won't. And so as soon as you get another population of children, you get another, another epidemic. So they show up about once a generation. And 53, there was a smallpox epidemic, but all the sources say it was farther north. So I don't know if it really affected the Tatutni, but measles did. And that's about eight years before the war. And so there's a real good chance, and according to the history, the older, the old, People said the sickness came from the south, which is they were cousins. Basically, they spoke the same language as the Talawa in Northern California, who had more contact with whites. This is the population of the white people, American for want of a better word. Ellensburg, which was not Gold Beach. Gold Beach is built up on the tableland above the river. Ellensburg was right on the bank of the river. Ellensburg was where the post office and the port office are right now. And it amounted to basically three buildings. It was a hotel and two general stores. So there were about 75 people spread out on the coast, along the river. Port Orford was a hard day away at 120 people. Crescent City was two, probably more, more like three days hike away. 638, 
and the only town in Southwest Oregon was Jacksonville, and that was at least 70s. Uh, Bedford had not been founded yet, Grants Pass had not been founded yet, and Jacksonville was basically the only community. Roseburg had 835. Eugene City, as it was called then, had about 1,000. Salem had about 1,000. Portland had about 1,000. Oregon City had about 2,000. So there weren't a lot of people around. And, but as far as Ellensburg was considered, they were a long ways away. So this is the locations at the start of hostilities. You had Ellensburg right about here, the Miner's Fort. There's a Yashu village there, but they had evacuated it at the time of hostilities. Elizabethtown was a small community, nine miles north, just south of Yutsika Beach now because the main trail going north came down here and then jogged inland along Edson Creek to the Tizutni village right here. And so this is a nice place for travelers to stop just when the coast trail ends and you move inland. And so they developed uh, that little community for travelers and to, to supply the miners in the area. Okay, need to get some young target. Uh, on December of 1853, the volunteer militia from Crescent City attacked the Tolawa Dene village at Yon Taket. It was They were gathered for the Nidash ceremony, which is their end of, end of the year, beginning of the year ceremony. And the volunteers surrounded the village at night and attacked it first light and killed 450 men, women, and children. And odds are good that the Tututni heard about this because they were married into the, the Tolawa. They spoke the same language. And they traded with them, so odds are they heard about this. Then, a month later, a group, another group of volunteers from the mining community of Randolph, which is where, about where Vandenberg's golf course is now, attacked the sleeping Nisoma village at the mouth of the Coquille River, where Bannon is. And again, they attacked the first light while they were sleeping and killed 15 men and one woman. Why did they attack? Because, because they were, the excuse or the reason was to prevent an Indian attack. This was the first strike. And the leader of the group from Bandel, Randolph was a man named Greg Abbott, or George Abbott, who we'll talk about later. Okay. About a month later, Chetco Village is at the mouth of the Chetco River. A man, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Miller, attacked the two villages of the Chetco and killed, again, first light as they were sleeping, killed about 36, more than 36. The reason stated was Mr. Miller wanted to operate a ferry across the mouth of the river. The Chetco wanted to did the same thing and undercut his prices. And so he eliminated competition. The story is the Indian agent arrested him and took him up to Port Arthur, which was the county seat at the time, and put him on trial. But because of the way the laws were written, no Native American Indian could testify in court. And so all the, the witnesses were white people who helped him do it, and he got off. He, had, he was basically released for lack of evidence. Next December, there's a pattern here. December again, during the Nidash ceremony, the village of Ashlet was attacked at first light. 65 to 150 people were killed. Now we come to Benjamin Wright. Benjamin Wright is one of the, the most interesting characters. He made Indian agent, he replaced J.L. Parrish, because J.L. Parrish said the Oregon Territory was not giving him enough money to do the job it needed the way it needed to be done. So he was using his own money and it was hurting his family's finances. So he resigned and the Indian superintendent picked Benjamin Wright to replace him which is interesting because he made his reputation as an Indian fighter in Wairika in the first Modoc Wars. And he 
California paid a salary to militias at the time, and they played a bounty on what paid a bounty on what like spells. And so he made a pretty good living doing this. In fact, there's if you look on it, there's something called Wright's Massacre, where he got a band of Modoc to meet him to negotiate a peace treaty. And then the next morning while they were sleeping, attacked him with, with his vigilantes. So he was a real interesting choice as an Indian agent. But everything I was reading, he did a really good job. He supposedly, and it's anecdotal, so I don't know how good it is, but he supposedly went to the vigilante militia in Crescent City and told them if they crossed the line into Oregon, they would be held to pay. And then he went to the Chetco and said, move up river, away from the white men, and whatever you do, don't retaliate south of the border, because I will just give them an excuse to attack you. So, you know, for someone who supposedly was an Indian fighter, that was pretty good. This is Joel Palmer. He was the overall superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Oregon Territory. His job was to arrange peace treaties with all the tribes in Oregon, and if possible, to get them on the reservations. And he believed, he was, a good, he, he was a good man. He left in 1857 because the people of Oregon thought he was too nice to the Indians. But he believed, which a lot of people did at the time, that the best bet for the safety of all the tribes was to get them away from the white men. Get them on a reservation where they have no contact with the white men and they can be protected by the army. And so that's what he did. Summer of 1855, August actually, this is the treaty grounds across from the Tootney village. Of course, they didn't have trucks in them, but this is a modern game. <laughs> and this is a, you know, a lot of view from it. And I don't know, I don't know the exact location, but it's right, right around here. And uh, the treaty almost didn't happen because as they were gathering the, all the various tribes and villages and the Indian agents and the army and everything, a minor in uh, Ellensburg saw a young native man on a horse that didn't belong to him. As he tried to stop him, the, the young man turned around and fired a pistol and hit him in the arm. The minor was not seriously injured, but he and his friends tracked the Indian down in the village in Pistol River and were going to hang him. Benjamin Wrights intervened with the army, took him into army custody, and were going to put him on trial. So they, the two army soldiers had this Indian and another guy in a canoe moving north, moving up river, when another canoe pulled up alongside them with three miners who opened fire and killed the Indian that in question. The soldiers returned fire, killed outright two of the miners, and mortally wounded the third. Well, at the sound of the gunfire, every Native American at the treaty guns was gone, jumped in their canoes and disappeared. Um, the army reacted. Uh, for a while there, it looked like the miners in Ellensburg were going to fight both the Tatutanese and the army. But cooler heads prevailed, talked them all down, and in September, the Tatutanese came back and signed the treaty. So it's called the Oregon Coast Tribes Treaty of 1855. And if you're really curious, I have a copy of it here. You can read afterwards. In the treaty, the tribes give up all claims, all lands west of the Cascade Mountains. They agree to cease all attacks against white populations or other tribes. If there's agreements, they're supposed to go to the agent and the government will take care of it. The tribal populations are being moved to the reservation on the north coast by the summer of 1856. The US government will establish that reservation and will budget a certain amount of money to support the Indians while they build, to build buildings, buy food, to teach them how to farm and raise livestock. And, so. and last of all, the government will establish a post to protect them. And so they agreed with this. The Tutuni had a, an extra thing that the other tribes didn't, that they could keep their canoes, that their canoes would be transported up there. And so they agreed to this, agreed that the only way to protect the people was to get away from the white men. Unfortunately, the Senate never ratified the treaty. Uh, President Franklin Pierce, in December, signed an executive order creating the 
North Coast Reservation, but there was no money appropriated for it. But the, no one told him, the two students. Then in October 1855, a major lieutenant of the Wairika Volunteers came up to Jacksonville, which was the only city in Southern Oregon, and had a town hall meeting where he railed against the natives. He had a whole list of crimes and a whole list of things he wanted to do against them. Worked up the people there and attacked a sleeping village, killed 23 mostly old men, women, and children. And this is right outside the Table Rock Reservation. Well, this was the Telkelna and Shasta who had agreed to live on the reservation because the army would protect them, looked at this and they said that the army wasn't going to protect them. And they left the reservation. And of course, none of these cities existed, but they went downhill looking for the canyons of the Siski. Figured they could hide out there and killing every white person they found along the way. On the basis of this and the Tekel and Chasta leaving the reservation, Governor Curry of uh, the Oregon Territory called up the militia. And that was the Gold Beach Guards, Company K, Second Oregon Monkey Boat, volunteers for a six month term. The militia are always called for six month terms. Little Boot Creek, again, a militia from Jacksonville attacked the village. And that was 19 to 26 people killed. And then, last week of the war, Hauenquat, which is another Tolabadunye, on the north bank of the Smith River. Again, in December, you notice all these attacks are in December. In this one, they killed 70 men, women, and children. And there were reports that the survivors moved north toward the Rogue River. So it's almost certain that the shooting knew about these. And so you have the situation where the Tatutni are peaceful. There's war upriver. There's massacres of the Talawa south of them and of the Nasoma ahead of them, but they remain peaceful. But you know that you have to be worried about it. Now we talked about Enos. Enos, another good character. There isn't a picture of him, there isn't a whole lot known about him, other than he was mixed blood. Some, some reports say he was white man, father, Shoshone mother. Others say he was Mati from the Red River country of Minnesota, North Dakota, French Canadian, but no one knows for sure. Supposedly he came into California as a guide with John C. Fremont's first expedition but he doesn't appear in any of the roles. He also worked as a guide and translator for Ben Wright in the Monarch Wars. So he was familiar to Benjamin Wright, the Indian agent, and he had married him to the Tututini village. So he was kind of a logical go-between between the whites and the Tututini. Because the, the folks in Ellensburg, being worried about the war up by the river, took the volunteer at the Gold Beach Guards, and they made a camp at the Big Bend of the Rogue River with the purpose of trying to prevent the hostile forces from our river coming down the river and attacking or convincing the, the Tatunis to join the war. And so they were up there in January 23rd, 1856, two of the volunteers were traveling upriver to that camp. One was Lieutenant John Clevenger, and Annette Huntley was a sergeant with them. On January 23rd, they were ambushed just downstream from the Illinois River. They were killed, as well, so was a Tatutney guide. Another Tatutney guide escaped, went down, returned down the river to Ellensburg with the tale of the ambush. The one that got away was Enos. He went to the miners in Ellensburg, said, told them about the attack, said, the Gold Beach Guards need more ammunition, more powder, more supplies of the camp at Big Bend. Miners said, fine, loaded up his canoe, he left and disappeared. <laughs> and the folks in Ellensburg thought this was kind of worrying. They thought perhaps the Tatutnis were beginning to listen 
the hostiles and the young men who wanted to fight. And so the reaction to that was to move the camp from Big Ben down to the treaty grounds across the river from the Tutuitni village. And that would be where the Tutuitni village was. It's at Bagnell's Ferry now. That, that was right where the Tutuitni village was. Now, I showed you before how Ellensburg is not Gold Beach. Before the jetties went in there, the Gold Beach was like, the Rogue River was like Pistol River or Hunter Creek. You never knew where the mountains was going to be or how wide it was. As you can see here, this is where the Coast Guard station is, how, how farther upstream the mountain is. And of course, this is after 32, because the bridge wasn't there at the time. But this is another view of it, and Ellensburg would be just three buildings right about in there. And notice the sandbars, it extends all the way back here. And modern view of it. Okay, they, they brought the Gold Beach Guards to the treaty grounds across from the Tutuitni village. One of the biggest questions I had going into this was why did the Tutuitni's attack? He'd been peaceful for so long, why did they attack and why did they attack then? My conclusion after reading it is they saw the volunteers camped across the river and they thought they were going to be next. They thought they were going to be attacked at one of these days at dawn. The volunteers wouldn't come up and attack them, so they beat them to the punch. And so, night of 20, February 22nd, Benjamin Wright had had dinner, walked down, he was killed, the captain of the Gold Beach Guards was killed. Next morning at dawn, as the soldiers are waking up, shots ring out, the attack is a total surprise. Of the 13 or 14 soldiers, nine of them were killed immediately. The others crawl off into the bush and hide until the Tichutni move on. At about the same time, at Elizabethton, the Geisels were sleeping. Someone knocked on their door. It turned out to be a maid, a Chituni woman they employed as a maid. She said, the baby was sick, can you help us? Opened the door, the men came in, overwhelmed. They were both Geisel, killed him, then killed his three sons, and kidnapped his wife and two daughters. This is, some of most of you know this, this is a Geisel monument. It's basically direct uh, graves of the family. That's Christina Geisel, much later, at the time of the attack, she was 33. She just had a, she had a two-month-old baby. So she's still recovering from childbirth. So the Tutuitnees are coming down the stream, heading for Ellensburg, when Mike, Constable Michael Riley, who was a constable for Coos County, which included this area at the time, was heading upstream to serve a subpoena on somebody. It, I have no idea who he's been served a subpoena to, but he was somewhere up the river and he heard shots ringing out. He convinced his two companions to return to Ellensburg, which they did, and he went to the hotel where the all-night dance was happening and told them that the Indians were attacking. And so the members of the Gold Beach Guard who were there went up river starway and formed a defensive line, while everybody else fled across the river and then to the miners' fort. And then they followed them. And as soon as they left, Tituni came in and burned everything. And I got the title of the book because William Tishner, trying to get to relieve the area, sailed by and he said, everywhere you looked, everywhere there was a structure, it was on fire, it was nothing but a blaze. The Tituni burned everything, every corral, every building, every shack, every sluice box, they burned everything. And it's really quite remarkable because nowadays with social media and cell phones and telephones, how hard it is to get everyone to show up at, at a party or something. <laughs> the Tatutni executed a simultaneous attack from Hubbard Mountain to Smith River with using only runners to communicate. Which is, as a military feat, that's just astounding. You know, to, to, to accomplish that. And basically, they burned every, every white Caucasian structure in the area, had all the survivor people in Miner's Ford between Hummock Mountain and Smith River. 
the, the people in Miner's Ford, the refugees as you call them, they, did, they thought they were alone. It's very remote. They, who would even know about their plight? What they didn't know was that Charles Foster, one of the soldiers at the treaty grounds, rolled away and hid until the Chitutney had left. He made his way north to Port Orford and reported the attack. And so Tishner tried to help them, bound the enemy in control on both, both sides of the river, and went on to Crescent City, and then sent his ship on to San Francisco. This is Fort Minor. Most locals know approximately where this is. This has been, was put there a long time ago by the Historical Society. And this is the location. It was formed in a marshy field. It's still pretty marshy. It's a cattle pasture now. But you notice one of the great things about it is, is it has an amazing field of fire. No one's going to sneak up on this fort. And, and the, the, the Union strike, the Tertuni tried to rush it two days after the first attack and were driven back by gunfire and never tried again. But this is a couple years ago, archaeologists from Southern Oregon University did a dig at Miner's Fort. This is their electrical, electrical resistance survey, which I like because it shows you the shape of the fort. It is 114 feet long, 68 feet wide. Sebastian on the northeast corner and one on the southeast corner. And it faces north and south, so the, the long side is facing toward the hills. This next one is, you didn't realize they could do an MRI on the ground, but they did. <laughs> and don't ask me what the colors mean, I have no idea. <laughs> I like this because it shows you the structures inside the fort. There's a cabin here that was 49 feet by 48 feet, and another cabin here that was 49 feet by 33 feet. Now in this, this structure, this fort, which is basically an earthen worm with the inside cut out. It wasn't, you know, logs with pointy tops like you see in the movies. And the cabins were, had no chimneys, they just had holes in the roof with smoke to get out. But the two cabins were dedicated to women and children. But it being the time it was, the white women refused to share a cabin with the Indian women. So the white women and children were in the big cabin the Satutni and Angeloa women, who were with miners, were in the smaller cabin. The men, about 80 men, stayed outside. So there were about 8 to 10 women, about 15 children, and the rest were men. And the men were mostly young, mostly single. They were from the gold fields. They were not, not soft men by any means. They were, they were pretty tough guys. But the problem was, Miner's Fort had, had no stores of food, ammunition, arms, anything. The, what they had was what they took with them. And so the problem in my head was, you've got 100 people, 50, 100, 150 people in this fort. How do you feed them? In the book, I, I figured out that it takes about 1,000 calories a day to keep a human being, an adult, healthy. But you're talking 100 people, it's 100,000 calories a day. How did they possibly get 100,000 calories a day? How, what did they do with sanitation for waste products? Um, you can't, going outside the port, you risk being shot. So I don't know, and as far as I can tell, no one inside there kept a diarrhea. So it's kind of lost to history. They also, at this point, they thought they were completely alone, that no one in the outside world knew about this. So in an effort to try to get help, they tied an American flag to a pole and then a white flag with the words help painted on it underneath it, hoping a passing ship would see them. But help was on the way. Charles Foster had, had gone to Port Orford, warned them. Tishner had gone down and went to the Army at Crescent City and tried to convince him Delancey Floyd Jones, who was a captain there, to uh, go up in relief. He was brand new in his post and didn't want to do anything until he got orders. So, General Wool, commander of the Pacific Region out of San Francisco, came out with this really drilling plan to defeat the Indians. 
One force from Fort Humble, Humble would come up north, relieve Miner's Fort, move up river toward the mouth of the Illinois River. Another force with reinforcements from Fort Vancouver would go overland to the mouth of the Illinois River. A third force would come down river from Fort Lane and crush the hostiles between them. The problem was he had no idea what the terrain was like. So Christopher Auger, with the reinforcements from Fort Vancouver, arrived at Fort Orford, went out overland, and arrived at the mouth of the Illinois River, and nobody else was there. And he sent out patrols and waited a little bit, saw no sign of them, so he got a little nervous being out in the middle of hostile territory. Had his men burned Shastakosti village, which was right there, exchanged a few shots with folks on the other side of the river, and he left. Now, Robert Buchanan was in charge, in command of the Southern Force. This is a Civil War era photograph. He was 45 at the time of the war. Under him was Edward Ord. This is also a Civil War photograph. He was 37. He had been roommates with William Sherman, Sherman in White mm -hmm. West Point. Floyd De Delancey Jones, it's Delancey Floyd Jones that's supposed to be changed, was 30 at the time. These, that was the Southern Force. And then we get back to George Abbott. Remember George Abbott from the Nosoma of Abandon? He was now in charge of a volunteer force from Crescent City because he figured that most of the Gold Beach Guards had been killed, so he was going to bring reinforcements. This is a letter to get, tell you some idea what the militia were like. This isn't from our area, this is from the Yakima War. And since you can't read it, I have a print up. As I march into the Yakima country tomorrow morning with all my disposable force, I am much embarrassed by these wanton attacks of the Oregon volunteers on the friendly Indians. Were I to accede to the request of the agent to such an extent to, to protect the Indians for the fishing season, it would diminish my force to such an extent as to render negatory my campaign in the Yakima country. Under these circumstances, and presuming that you still have retained authority over the Oregon territory, Oregon territorial jurisdiction, I have to request that they may be withdrawn from the county on the north side of the border. This was to, to Governor Curry from Colonel Wright, commander in Washington. So the army didn't have, not have any respect for the volunteers whatsoever. This is Major Reynolds. He was a commander at Fort Orford. Christopher Auger came down from Fort Vancouver. He was also Major Reynolds was 35 at the time. Auger was 34 at the time. Now you see, on the 18th, Auger attacked the Shastikosti village, and on the 18th, the volunteers, who were tired of the slow pace of the regulars coming up, went ahead and walked right into a an ambush. And the Battle, Battle of Pistol River, that's in two years, that the two knee killed one volunteer and wounded several, killed a lot of horses, and they were pinned down until the regular army came and the Sudanese melted away. And Captain Ord at the time, who has a journal, which is really interesting, he does not care a bit about the volunteers. They seem to have had a hard time. <laughs> so, this is the approximate location of the Shastikosti village. The mouth of the Illinois is right over here. Pistol River Bell, I don't know where exactly where it was. It's on the south side of the river, but the river changes every year. That's a look at it south. Okay, so the 13th, the regular army crossed, crossed the Pistol River on the 19th, camped there. The 20th, they arrived in the Ellisburg ruins. They exchanged some rifle fire with hostiles up in the woods, but I think one doctor got shot in the hand. That was no casualty. Petitioner, who had accompanied them as a guide, fixed one of the boats and they crossed the river the next day and relieved Miner's Fort. So the folks in Miner's Fort were there from the 23rd of February till March 21st when they were relieved. Four days later, the reconstituted Gold Beach Darks attacked the Susudney village, but they found it empty. It had been deserted. 
So they burned it, burned all the houses, burned all the stores, and returned to their camp at Ellensburg. Oops, wrong way. That's a Tuchutni village again, another sign. Not to be outdone, the regular army, the next day, Captain Ord attacked Mikanatune village, 15 miles upstream, and it's approximately where, at the, near the mouth of Lobster Creek. This time, they got resistance. The village was deserted when he got there, but as they started to burn it, the Tuchutni attacked, but Ord was a pretty good uh, military man, he anticipated this at a defensive line already set up. And so they exchanged fire, finally forcing the Tutni back and then across the river. He had two men wounded, the Tutni lost what they killed. And he was very proud because this was the first regular army to Tutni conflict. He, he wanted action. That's a proxy. Actually, the Tony Tutni village was more about here with the river exchange. Okay. A month later, for a month there's nothing. You read his journals and they're elk hunting and they're salmon fishing. There is no sign of the Tutunis. The army is moving north and south and all through the area there's nothing. Then on 24th of April, militia set up on the rocks near Lobster Creek and caught three canoes coming downstream. And they ambushed them. The, what, whoever survived the initial shots drowned in the river. They killed like 15. It's still known as Massacre Rock to these days. And you can see that's the Lobster Creek Bridge right there. And now, at this point, the Tutuni were in bad shape. All their major villages had been burned. They were not nomadic peoples, so most of their food stores burned with the villages. And so they basically had no food, very little clothing, and their weapons, and they couldn't I mean, they were still fish in the river, but the army controlled the river. They were, every time you went out to hunt deer, you risk getting killed. So they contacted the army and said, we'd like to talk peace. So Buchanan's force went up the river to Indian Creek, then went up in the hills and crossed over to Oak Flat. Reynolds and Augur came on the north side and camped near present day Agnes. And J.R. Smith came down from the, up the river and they met the in on Oak Flat and convinced them that the only way they were going to survive was to surrender and move to the reservation. The Tatunis and Tacomas and Chastas agreed they couldn't go on like this. They were destitute, basically. And they agreed two weeks later they would meet at Big Bend to surrender. So May 27th, J.R. Smith's force moves up there to accept their surrender. And the, the Tutuni start coming in, and they're, they're happy, they're relieved, they're playing a game called skinny, which is like field hockey, and they seem fine, and then all of a sudden the mood changes. And Smith notices this and moves his men into a defensive position. What happened was militia from Jacksonville had started getting on the banks of the river and shooting the people as they're moving down to the, the surrender area. And so the Tatutini started to suspect this wasn't gathering the people to accept their surrender, it was gathering the people to massacre them. And so they attacked. And they charged Smith's line and were repulsed because Smith had a cannon. Then changed their tactics and took two ridges on either side of them and set up a crossfire. And it was over the battle lost all day, most of the night. Smith had to reposition his forces because he took so many casualties. And the next day it was looking pretty bad, but a young man named Charles Foster escaped, who had been guiding them, crossed the lines in the middle of the night, went down to Christopher Augers and told him what the problem. So the next day Christopher Augers' force came in from the side, outflanked the Tatutinis, drove them back to the river and they surrendered. And that was the last major battle. At this point, the army was basically taking them to Port Orford to move the reservation. At Painted Rock, <coughs> Christopher Augers' force came upon a small village, exchanged fire with them, drove them across the river, but the volunteers were across the river, so it was pretty bad. And that was, that was it. Big Ben, 
There is a monument up there or a memorial. I've never been to it because you have to hike into it. But I'd like to see. And that's, so that's basically all. The key things I noticed in this was, other than Big Ben, the Tutuni never attacked the army. They defended their villages a couple of times. The only attacks they made were against the volunteers. But when the army showed, they disappeared. They went away. Then, Chief John, or Kumtum of the Shasta, was the last hostile leader to surrender. Surrendered June 29, 1856, to Captain Ord on the heights above Reinhardt Creek. Captain Ord took him to Port Orford, where they gathered all the people to ship north to the, the Coast Reservation, which the people of Selects called the Oregon Trail of Tears, but that's a different story. And that's it. That was the, what I know of the war. It was a very short war. It's a very sad war. It didn't have to happen. It's mainly because most wars because they could, couldn't communicate. And you know, the, the miners in. Ellensburg were terribly afraid of an Indian attack. The Indians were terribly afraid of a minor attack, and it just went from there. So, any questions? No. Where, where was the reservation? The reservation was the original reservation was from the mouth of Silk Coast River, south of uh, Lawrence now, to way past uh, to it was way north of Newport. But then over the years, the government kept taking more and more of it until it just became the Salettes. But at that point, no whites had settled in that area. And, you know, so you had the coast range separating them from the Willamette Valley, so it protected them to a certain extent. Yes? Yeah, uh, can you uh, describe to me in greater detail what Miner's Fort was at? Okay, Miner's Fort is one, about one mile north of the Rogue River. It's in a, a cattle pasture owned by the Knox family. If you take, go 101, there's an exit to, to drift to, to Broke Hills, and it says to the mouth of the river. You take that, and there's a housing development right on the coast, right. and it's right back behind that. It's that pasture. Yeah, just that it's pasture. pasture. And it's all the Wedderburn Road there. Yeah, the It's just, actually, there's a cross street going east and west, I think it's called Fort Way. And it's directly, that was the way they dragged the logs from the beach onto it. Okay. Yes? I was just going to say that the fort was closer to uh, more of a one than it is to the right. Yeah. Okay. But then, you know, strategically, the story is Michael Riley, who came back from San Francisco after getting his wife and child, came back to Ellensburg and saw they had built a couple of block houses in Ellensburg. But they're right there in that forest of bluff where the, you know, someone could sit up there under cover and shoot at them. You know, this is stupid, so he built this miners' fort. And so what's the story about Enos, the instrumental in the, in the death of, of Ben Riley, yeah, supposedly in his car? Yeah, supposedly he and uh, the Tutney woman, who was um, the translator for Ben Wright, supposedly took me his heart at, that night after that. But that's, you don't know if that's true or just an anecdote. But, and then Enos was later tracked down in the Grand Ronde Reservation and brought back and supposedly found not guilty and then hung anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I live on Esa Creek Road. Mm -hmm. so just right down from my house. Mm -hmm. um, it is Mrs. Edison's. There's a, a picket fence where a grave is. So that's Mrs. Geisel. But what happened to her? Did, was she? She survived. Um, her youngest daughter, the, the baby, the two-month-old, passed away. Her oldest daughter was 14 at the time they were abducted. They were ransomed by the people in the fort. A lot of the, the sources say the, peop, the folks inside the fort heard they were captives and, and offered to ransom them, which in my mind doesn't make any sense because you go out there and approach them, they're going to shoot you. So my idea was it was the two who approached the people in the fort to get them. And so they were 
Grab some for some blankets, a hat, and uh, some of the native women that were inside the fort. And so the 14-year-old daughter survived. She ended up marrying a rancher on the Chico River. Uh, Mrs. Geisel ended up marrying and divorcing twice, and then outliving a third husband, and then was killed basically at a home invasion round in like 1887. And her house burned down and she didn't it. It's interesting, her, her, her grave is in a small grove tree, but it's well cared for. Yeah, they, the they, um, they buried her husband's sons where they found them, and then when she died, they, they added her to it. I believe her, her daughter is buried there, too. Oh, okay. And so basically, that's right where the, the family was found when they, they came in. And she, you know, the picture is a lot later. <coughs> It's like in the 1880s, but she doesn't look like a happy woman. <laughs> there we go. She does not look like a happy woman. <laughs> but the, the thing I was most interested in was why attack them. And I think it's the volunteers. And I also have, if anyone's interested, I have a list of the militia members. Gold Beach Guards. Yeah. Uh, it's about between two and five hundred. And so the it's a very small war, but for the populations involved, it was probably the bloodiest Indian war. Because the original 130 whites, 35 of them were killed in the first attack. You know, so you're talking uh, uh, almost one-third casualty rate. And of course, the problem I had with, with researching this was no one asked the students about their side of the story. And no one, I mean, even scientists even talked to them until the 30s. And there's nothing And there's nothing written. And so a lot of it's supposition. And so hopefully I got it right. <laughs> yes? No. Yes, but it's huge. It's, but there might be, you know, because some of the names are familiar. Uh, Peter McGuire had a brother named Jerry McGuire, which I think is Jerry's flat road. Um, Jim Hunt, was a member. Uh, Charles Foster, was I think, you know, Foster Bar, Foster Lodge, all them. There's some, there's some names on here that I, I'm familiar with. So I don't know if anybody who grew up locally has local roots would recognize their ancestors here. And you know, it's basically they re they replaced the officers and sergeants who got killed in the, in the attack from the people within the fort. And then, as you look down here, there's a man named George Abbott who's also a first lieutenant, and he's the guy who came up from. And he, interesting. The aftermath, all the soldiers, the army people you saw in this, ended up in the Civil War. Um, uh, Captain Ord, Edward Ord, Fort Ord is named after Ord. Um, John Reynolds, who commanded Fort Orford, was killed on the first day at Gettysburg. His brigade held the village of Gettysburg to keep the Confederates from advancing so the Union Army could set up. Um, Christopher Otter was, was a gen general. Um, the other ones were, I think Colonel Buchanan ended up a colonel, but they all, most of them survived the Civil War and ended up with long careers in the military. And Michael Riley, who <coughs> saved the town of Ellensburg, ended up being the first sheriff of Curry County, appointed by the governor, then became a representative in the legislature, then became sheriff again, and then became a judge and retired as a judge. And he and his wife Maria are buried in the Pioneer Cemetery. But most of the people, Ralph Bledsoe, who headed up the second Gold Beach Guards militia, died at the gold fields in uh, Idaho. George Abbott, who led thing, died in Idaho. But most of these people were gold seekers that left and went to the next gold strike. Most of the most of the men here were not pioneers looking to settle down; they were looking for gold. And so I don't know how many of them actually settled down here. And there, is, there isn't a whole lot of information on there. Because, like, you know, 
They'll be hitting semantic cameras, which is real unfortunate, cell phones. <laughs> Good right. And so most of the photographs are, you know, Civil War era. More. So what was the pivotal reason for the Indians' attack? The, the Gold Beach Guard, the militia, had come from upriver and camped directly across the street from the Tututni village. Okay. Directly across the river. And they were afraid they were getting ready to attack them. Right. And so that, they, that's including the Ellensburg? Yeah, that was just the start of it. They, I, I believe, I don't know for sure because nobody asked them. No, right. But that would be my supposition that they decided to attack first before they were attacked. Because of all those other massacres the volunteers had done, they saw that and saw the writing on the wall and decided we'll attack first. Can I say something? Yes. I haven't had an opportunity to read the book, but I know that it's very is it, in case you don't know, this is my stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> so, and I am a very big tribute fan. And I have been Thank you for watching. Please be sure to visit Curry Public Library at 94341 3rd Street in Gold Beach during their normal business hours, most days starting at 10 a.m. For additional information about the Curry Public Library or future events such as what you've just seen, please call 541-247-7246 or visit the library's website at the URL https colon slash slash www.currypubliclibrary.org slash events dash library underscore events underscore calendar. We hope you enjoyed this presentation brought to you by Curry Public Library, Curry County Voices, the Gold Beach Rotary Foundation, and viewers like you. Be involved.